I want to start with a story. One of the reasons I'm here today is this story. I teach a lot. I like to teach, primarily graduating cohorts of engineering schools, not just in Canada, across America as well. What I try to convince is the third of the class to start a business. Sometimes I might invest in them. Engineers are good at doing that, and they're in huge demand. China is going to graduate 250,000 engineers this year. We'll get about 48,000 in the United States and a few thousand in Canada. We're falling behind. So I'm concerned. I'm trying to encourage these people. Now, recently I've taught at Waterloo. I've taught at McGill, at the Ivy Business School, Notre Dame, MIT. Every time I teach a class, generally these are evening classes, guest lecturers, 6 to 9 p.m. When it's over, cohorts are about 160 in size. Every time I teach in Canada, not some of the time, every time, a large portion of the class comes down afterwards and we're having an open dialogue together and says to me, Kevin, can I borrow your Rolodex from Microsoft, for Uber, for Facebook? Do you know anybody there that can get me a job? And I say to them, what are you doing? You've just graduated from the very finest educational institution this country has to offer. A brand like McGill or Waterloo is global. Why do you want to leave Canada? And here's their answer. Why should I be paid in dollarettes? Why should I be taxed at 54%? How can I ever hire a team to grow a global business when I can't even compete with all the other offers they're getting where you, they pay significantly less tax in the United States and they get stock options that are worth something? Why even try? Our financial policy in this country, and you can see it right there in their eyes, is broken. It's broken. And how can I say that with certainty? I just have to look at the deficits. Let's just pick one example. Ontario. $308 billion in debt. That's twice the deficit of the state of California with half the population. That is the legacy of waste. That's what it is. Of broken policy at the government level, and even more damning, and even worse for every Canadian, incompetency. That's what it is. Why and where is it written in Canada that we need to be the monopoly of mediocrity when it comes to managing fiscal and economic policy? That's my question to everybody here. We should be ashamed of it. Let's be specific. And here's why I'm here. I'm using this platform, and I obviously have a dialogue with Canadians every day in the media, but I, as an investor, I, as a Canadian, have had enough. It's very simple. I watched our country in just the last six months completely collapse its entire energy business from bad financial policy. Let me explain that. You know, it's easy for any politician to simply say, I can't control the price of oil, and that's true. But what's really happened in Alberta, and I want to be very specific about this, because it's affecting everybody in this room, is this. Only three years ago, the envy of North America, for many reasons, was Alberta. Today, it's in shambles. It's destroyed. The reason we should be concerned is that our number one export in this country is energy. Miles ahead of the second export, which is automotive and automotive parts. Energy is the economic driver of this country. That's what it is. It's not to be ashamed of. It's not to be concerned that we have to switch it out next week. It's going to be the driver for the next 25 years. Get over it. It's very important to support it. I listened to Rachel Notley speak to investors in New York, and I wept. I can't believe what she said. She told them she was embarrassed that we made oil in Canada. She told them, she told them that she was going to tax it with three billion more dollars while she was raising corporate taxes. And she told them she had no idea when she would set policy on royalty rates. She made damn sure not one dollar left that room from investors. It went somewhere else. And that is one of the reasons the Canadian dollar has collapsed.
There's no demand for it right now. I don't have enough time to stay on the energy program, but I want you to know why it matters. It's 40% of the economy. It really matters. What I'm going to be doing with this platform and why I'm here today is I've decided that in every government policy regarding spending from now on, I'm going to spend a tremendous amount of energy exposing it to the public and showing them where it's broken. That's the plan. Let's take the Ontario budget fresh off the plate from last night. It was advertised as a no-tax budget. That's a load of crap. There's $1.9 billion of cap-and-trade tax. That's a direct tax on Ontario consumers. I'll explain why. The companies that have that put on them have to pass it through to the consumers. But it's worse than that. There is no evidence anywhere on this planet that cap-and-trade reduces emissions. Anywhere on this planet. Nowhere. But what we have created in this province is a slush fund. And worse than that, full of fat, wasteful bureaucracy. Hundreds of people will have to be put to work in the bureaucracy of Ontario, which is already fat and wasteful, to administer this slush fund. I am going to spend every day exposing the waste of that $1.9 billion, pointing it out to Canadians that it's outrageous. I hope to make this a nightmare for politicians to think they can continue wastefully spending our money. If this party wants to win the next election, it's very simple. There'll be three issues. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. Because in this country, there are none. Go back to those graduates. They want to leave our country. Our job is to make this the number one place you want to stay and work. Our job is to make this the number one economy where people want to invest in energy above any other. So the incremental investment comes to Canada first not to tax it into the stratosphere. Our job is to reduce our personal taxes here so we're competitive globally. We're now the highest tax jurisdiction in North America. That's not competitive. You should be worried about this, just like I am. So my strategy is very simple. I'm going to watch this budget that's coming from the Liberal government, and I've promised this to the new finance minister who I met for the first time last week at a function celebrating George Cope as a CEO. I'd never met him before, but I went to meet him and I said, listen, Bill, I don't like deficit spending. I'm going to be your worst nightmare. I'm going to tear that budget to pieces. Yeah. And what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it is I want transparency and I want the Canadian people to understand where I think the risks are in all of these strategies. And then let's see what happens. And the reason I want to do that at every level of government is to make sure that now these politicians that are implementing this waste understand they will be accountable to the Canadian people that are paying these bills. I think that's the most effective role I can have in this economy. That is my only interest, is to affect economic and fiscal policy and make it more efficient for Canadians, to make this country competitive to make it a place where engineers don't want to leave. That is very, very important. My son's in engineering. He's an American, he's Canadian, and he's Irish. He has all three passports. When the time comes for him to take a job, I want him to take it here, because it's the best place to do it. And we are miles away from that right now. We are on a path to a very bad outcome. Government can't spend $40 billion efficiently. How do we know this? The legacy of waste in any province. That $300 billion of, of deficit is waste. A third of every dollar government spends on infrastructure is completely wasted. So I don't know about you, but I'm unhappy about it. <laughs> and the best thing I can do is expose the light of reason and have the Canadian people understand where the mistakes are being made. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. And as somebody said, tell us what you really think. I think we know. 
uh, and thank you for that uh, presentation. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit, y you've stressed the, the absolute importance of e economic and fiscal issues, a and yet m many Conservatives have been trying to make those points, those points were attempted to be made in the last elections in Ontario. Like, what more has to be done to bring the importance of, the, of bring Conservative fiscal responsibility issues to bear so that the, it gets traction with the public? It's not enough to just be a critic. You have to offer an alternate path. Let's take, for example, Alberta. How would you fix it tonight? What you would immediately do is repeal the 10% increase to corporate taxes. You would go back and announce that for any new dollars coming into Alberta, as of midnight tonight, you're going to accelerate the capital cost allowance to a 12-month deduction. In addition to that, any new production by any new dollars coming in gets a 36-month royalty holiday. You have to make it the most attractive place on earth for the incremental dollar to be invested. Rachel Notley doesn't know how to do this. She's an incompetent. I'm sorry. It's harsh words. It's harsh words, but it doesn't detract from the truth. And that is important to all of us here because it's still the energy growth driver combination that we need in Canada. We have to solve that problem immediately. Secondly, this debate we're having about pipelines, why are we listening to politicians anymore? Let's make this a national referendum. Let's ask Canadian people yes or no. Do you want to build a pipeline to reduce the 25% discount to our landlocked oil? Yes or no? Ask every Canadian to vote. And if there's a 51% majority, it's over. It's done. No politician will have the moral right to stop it from happening. And I think we should do more of this in Canada because we waste our time bickering. If the Canadian people don't want the pipeline, let's stop worrying about it. But I have a feeling that after we debate it nationally, perhaps they'll see the reason for why it's so important to help with the tailwinds we've got. We've got a really big challenge in this country. And above all, you just can't criticize without showing the different path. Take, for example, economy that's only 2.5% of the world's GDP. You can't waste a billion dollars on anything. Let's talk like Bombardier, which is now asking for $2 billion. Do you realize that every shareholder in that company over the last 17 years has lost all of their money? They have taken $2 billion from you out of your pocket, and they've only returned $600,000, you'll never, $600 million, you'll never see the rest. Why? Dual voting class share. Let's not get technical, but the way to solve the problem, and I think we should save that company, is to simply say, let's make it a private sector deal. I would be willing to back that company by sending in the case they pull first and getting a deal done at looking at it and do a market deal. Lend the company money, 7 to 14% is the going rate for mezzanine debt, get real equity and abolish the dual voting class share. That has to happen. And then you make money when the company comes back because you backed it and other foreign companies are willing to buy the aircraft because you guaranteed it as a Canadian taxpayer, you make money. So my message is to all levels of politics and politicians, no more stupid deals. No more. They have to be market deals so I get my money back. That's important. That's what matters. So these are paths to alternatives. That's what you need to do. Show people that you have a plan, that it's not just rhetoric. You have to have a plan. I'm sick of seeing my money wasted. I'm really pissed off. <laughs> okay, okay. Now, what about one of the things uh, conservatives are sometimes accused of uh, focusing, almost fixating the economy and the fiscal side? Uh, are, are there other policy areas where, where you feel conservatives need to be strengthened in, the, in their uh, approach to the public? Uh, not until we've stabilized the economy. Not until we can guarantee graduating cohorts jobs here. Everybody in this room knows somebody that's 25 years old that can't get meaningful employment. We have to solve that. That is the core of what makes us Canadian. You have to have a stabilized economy that's growing at 3 to 5% every year to provide for the youth that keep coming into it. It doesn't matter what province you're in. You can't do anything else until you've got a stable economy. My number one mandate is to solve that. There's many other issues to deal with, including the environment. But that is not our number one problem right now. If somebody can't get a job, that is our number one problem. So you should ask yourself, every time you listen to a politician speak and you listen to what they say, did that create one incremental job for Canada? What got me so concerned about Trudeau part two is this. In the first 60 days, and I was wide open, I was ready to listen, I wanted to hear the plan. He left this country and spent $4.2 billion of my money and didn't create one incremental job 
for any graduating cohort. That should really bother you because that sets the tonality of this government to spend recklessly and huge risk comes into that because if you think like I do, a third of that money will be wasted, that burden is not just on our children, it'll be for the next three generations. And by the way, 10 cents of every tax dollar collected now is paying interest on our debt. This is federally, and this is when interest rates are at an all-time low. Mm -hmm. This place will turn into Venezuela if rates go up. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. 